prepared are we for the second exodus? Our preparation begins with understanding the force that hindered our forefathers from entering the promised land. Instead, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. We certainly don't want to repeat the mistakes of our ancestors, so we have to understand why they stumbled. What hindered their progress? Unbelief. In this session, we will discuss how unbelief can prevent us from receiving the things that are rightfully ours from the kingdom of heaven. So most of us know the story of how the 10 spies brought back an evil report when Moses sent them out to spy out the land of Canaan. That's found in Numbers 13. We're not able to go up against the people of Canaan for they are stronger than we. Giants are in the land and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, they reported. Their words caused the people to fear and the Most High called their words evil. So the 10 men saw something that caused them to forget the power they had just witnessed when they came out of Egypt. But most importantly, they forgot that it wasn't their strength that brought Egypt to its knees. So why would they even say, we are not able? But Hebrews 4 would later say they had hardened their hearts and did not enter because of unbelief. So only two men, Joshua and Caleb, chose to believe that they were able to defeat the giants. So we see that faith and unbelief are opposing forces. Messiah had to rebuke the disciples many times for their unbelief. Let's look at some examples. We have Mark 16, 14. It says, later he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And then in Matthew 17, 19, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. We see another example here from Mark 6, 1 through 6. Speaking about Messiah, then he went out from there and came to his own country and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. So we see that the people in his hometown could not receive from the kingdom due to their unbelief. They rejected him and were offended in other words, the thought was, who do you think you are? They wanted to treat him as common. Even though they knew he was doing mighty works elsewhere and they were astonished by his teaching, they would not believe because they couldn't see him as more than the carpenter, the homeboy they knew from the village. Their unbelief was so overpowering that Messiah had to marvel 
and it also prevented him from doing the mighty work he wanted to do there. Can you see how powerful unbelief can be? It's an opposing force and it can prevent us from receiving from the kingdom. You all, we're going to have to have a certain level of faith to overcome what's coming on this earth. There's a reason Messiah asked if he would find faith on the earth when he returns. Just imagine how crazy things are going to get for that question to even be asked. I think we have had a problem remembering. We fail to remember the miracles. We fail to remember the promises. We kept going back into slavery because we didn't remember the sins that got us there. So we need to learn how to remember. In Deuteronomy 6.12, Moses issued a final warning to the Israelites, our forefathers. He said, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. We've forgotten. I was given a song during my time of worship not long ago that says, cause us to return, cause us to remember, cause us to cry out to you, Most High. Because when we remember him and ourselves, we can cry out to him in repentance and he will restore the years that the locust has eaten. But we need to remember. So failing to remember can fuel our unbelief and prevent us from receiving from the kingdom. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The most basic definition for unbelief is knowing or hearing the word of the Most High and refusing to believe. You prove that you believe when you do it. So refusing to believe could be for various reasons, could be fear, rebellion, not wanting to be made a shame, but the root of it is mistrust. You don't trust. You don't trust the one that said it and the one able to perform it. Let's keep going. I've noticed something about Europeans. They know how to create monuments. They can often be heard saying, may we never forget when tragedy hits or if they have momentous occasions, um, you know, when they win in wars. For almost, what, 250 years on July 4th, there's going to be a celebration to mark their Independence Day. Have we failed to make memories? Obviously we did. Let's read this from Exodus 12, 12 through 14. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. This was not supposed to end. So, again, would we be in our current predicament if we would have continued to rehearse the mighty acts the Most High did for us? Because not only does it help us to increase in faith, it also gives Him glory. And honor. Let's keep going. Let's read the scripture from John 14 12. Messiah is speaking, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me 
the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. So do we know of believers doing great works? The apostles did great works, but were they greater than the works of Messiah? So when are we supposed to do these greater works? But would he say we will do it if it wasn't possible? I think this is the challenge for us right now. Are we ready to believe that we can do the greater works? Are we willing to stand on the word, on the promises we've been given and not back down? Are we ready? Listen to this from Luke 7, 1 through 10. Now, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, just speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were, and those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. So what a charge against our forefathers. Gentiles able to receive the things of the kingdom by faith. Who are we to say they can't be partakers if the Father has granted benefits of the kingdom to them because they're able to believe? Yes, salvation is of the Jews or of the Yehudi, but our sovereign is gracious to those who will come to him and believe him. Believe his word. And this centurion was able to do that. Are we willing to step up and have that same type of faith? Same level of faith where we can say, if, the, if your word says it, it's going to be done. He sent his word and healed and delivered from destruction. Let's keep going. So I hope you're beginning to see that it's not enough to know that we are the chosen people to receive the benefits of the kingdom. Hear me. Unbelief will keep you from receiving what is rightfully yours because the currency of the kingdom of heaven is faith. Let's refer back to the scripture I read earlier from Hebrews 11:6. It tells us that it is impossible to please our Elohim, our sovereign, without faith. And this is why we may see those of other nations receiving the benefits of the kingdom, like Rahab. Rahab is listed as one of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. She was not an Israelite, <laughs> but she believed in the God of Israel and she proved it by her actions. She wanted to live 
So she made the connection by helping his people. The centurion that we just read about and Rahab, they had these things in common. They were also very observant. They could see that this God of the Israelites must be the true God because of the things they observed. They saw the mighty acts and they believed. Why else would the centurion send his servants to Yahshua? So now tell me, how is it that strangers know how to receive the benefits of the kingdom when so many of the natural branches do not? This scripture right here is telling us we have to believe. So we can't get upset with those who have learned how to please the king. If you study our history carefully, you'll see that we've struggled with unbelief. And normally when you struggle with unbelief, there's also a root of fear. So I believe one thing that we need to begin to pray for is boldness. Because we need to get rid of the fear that would prevent us from stepping out in faith. Acts 4.31 says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So step one, pray for the infilling of the Holy Spirit to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then pray for boldness so that we can say and do the things that we need to do in these last days to see the power and manifestation of the kingdom. So remember that we are given power so that we can do something. Let's read this from Mark 16, 17 through 18. Messiah is speaking and he's saying, and these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So you can operate in the signs because you believe the word that was spoken from the sovereign. Just like Messiah was sent, he sent his word to heal us. We have also been sent to do something. And he lists some of them here. Cast out demons, speak with new tongues, take up serpents. Now, this one has many scratching their heads because obviously he's not telling people to be snake handlers. <laughs> and some are doing that. But let's think about someone having to do this. Take up serpents. Moses. Remember when he had to throw his rod down and it turned into a snake, he was told to grab it and take it up by the tail. Moses ran, <laughs> but he had to pick that up by the tail. And the purpose was for him to overcome the fear of it. Because when, when he was told to take it by the tail, if you think about a snake charmer, they would normally grab it by the neck. But Moses had to show his trust in Yah by taking it up by its tail. The other thing of significance with that is that the Egyptians reverenced snakes. In some references, it says that the snake was the protector of the Pharaoh. And that's why you see it, you know, prominently displayed on their headdress. So is it any wonder that the first miracle performed before Pharaoh was turning the rod into a serpent and then having the rod of Aaron devour the serpents of the magicians? So now think about us. The enemy of Israel is the serpent, just like it was before. The serpent and his descendants. That's who is warring against Israel in these last days.
So we see this corresponding verse here in Luke 10, 17 through 20. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you, catch this, the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Our names are written in heaven and we have been given the authority to act on everything he's given us to do, to have dominion, to reign, to rule, to be the kings and priests in the earth. Let's keep going. So as I said, we've been sent. John 20, 21 through 22. So Jesus said to them again, peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And we, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So if you want to think about it in terms of being an ambassador, we're representatives here on earth of the kingdom of heaven. Let's look at the primary responsibilities of an ambassador. All right, so this comes from Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. It says an ambassador is, ambassador is an official envoy, especially a diplomatic agent of the highest rank accredited to a foreign government or sovereign as the resident representative of his or her own government or sovereign or appointed for a special and often temporary diplomatic assignment. So an ambassador is an authorized or sent representative or messenger. But notice it says an agent of the highest rank. Do we see ourselves that way as sent ones, as ambassadors on assignment doing the work of the kingdom? But not only that, we have the authority to act on behalf of the kingdom. Ambassadors have to have confidence in their ability to act on the authority they've been given. Look at this <clears throat> from John 14, 12 through 14. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest you, yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine but the fathers who sent me. Look at what he's saying here. If you love the word, you'll do it. Notice he doesn't say, I will love him who keeps the word. He says the father will love him. Then he says, we will come. We will come. Because when you receive the word, you receive the father also because the word came out of the father. Let me restate it this way. The authority came from the sovereign, which is the father. The sovereign speaks the word. The word is Yahshua. This has been a very difficult concept for many to understand and they keep tripping over this truth. Think about your words when you speak to someone. What you say is an expression of who you are. It represents your thoughts, your beliefs, your feelings, your intentions, etc. 
Your word represents you. That's who Yeshua is. He's the words that the Father speaks. He's one with the Father. He's God. That's why he says we will come and make our home with him. The scripture tells us that the Father's word is his power. So in order for Yeshua to be manifested in this world or the word of the Father to be manifested in this world, the Father had to create a body for him. If you can grasp that concept, then you will understand this. To receive the power of the kingdom, you have to act on the authority of his word. Let's keep going. As ambassadors, we have to be able to carry out our duties. That's why we were sent. But you have to know how to receive the power from on high that will help you do what you were sent to do. The just will live by faith. Faith is not seeing it first. It's believing it first. And unbelief can block or delay the things that we need to receive from our headquarters. In a lot of cases, we don't respond in faith because of fear. And there are times when we don't want to be ashamed if the thing doesn't manifest. I've been there, done that. So I'm continuing to grow as well. But don't you see when you operate in faith, you're acting on the word of the one able to make the thing happen. But you have to have a relationship with him. You learn about him and his ways when you spend time in his word and in his presence. When you make time to fellowship with him, he will reveal his will to you. I'll share a testimony with you. This, oh gosh, this probably happened about nine eight or nine years ago one of our workshop coordinators had trouble with her car she it was time for her to leave for the day and i noticed that she came back into the office so i asked her you know if there was a problem she said her car wouldn't start and she had to try to reach her husband and then he would have to try to call a tow truck to come and get her and her husband uh, wasn't close by so I said, well, we can take care of that. Let's go pray all over this car. And she looked at me like, okay. So we went out and I said, okay, I'm going to lay hands on the car. You get in and you try to start it. So she got into the car and I laid hands on the hood and started praying. And she tried to start it the first time. Nothing happened. And I kept praying. I said, you keep turning. And I kept praying. Within 10 minutes, that car started. She jumped out of that car. And she just started praising. And her faith level just shot up. You could just see she was just like incredulous. Like, I can't believe that happened. But I know that it happened. But where did that faith come from in me? It didn't start there. I had an experience where uh, I was coming home from work and I was, gosh, maybe a minute from my house. And I had to go through this uh, four-way light. And as soon as I got to the light, it's like my car just died. Like it was barely moving. I could barely make it through the light. When I finally got through, I couldn't even pull over on the side. So I was stuck in the road. And it just so happened that this couple was behind me. They got, and got out and said, is there a problem? I said, I can't get this thing to start. I don't know what happened. So he got into it and tried to start it. Nothing happened. Looked under the hood. So he and his wife got in front of the car they said you get in the seat you turn and we're gonna lay hands on your car and pray and they prayed and within minutes 
that car started they said okay we're gonna follow you home because I could actually see my house from where we were they said we're gonna follow you home to make sure you get there safely once you're in the driveway then we'll leave so that car I mean it was barely moving but it got me home as soon as it got in the driveway it stopped again and nothing it would not start but I was praising and just thanking the most high and thanking them but that's how we should increase in our faith from faith to faith we grow from faith to faith and when you have things miraculous things happen for you you need to share it with others so that their faith can increase and their faith can grow but that wasn't the only experience i'd had like that years ago gosh probably 15 years ago i was doing a signing at on a military military installation and I was inside the building and remembered that I needed to get something out of my car. Went back to my car and realized I had locked my keys in the car. I could see my keys sitting on the seat. It was, I, I believe it may have fallen out of my purse when I was trying to get out of the car. But inside I was panicking. It's like, okay, the only one who has a key that can help me right now is my husband. And he's more than an hour away. And it was hot out there. And I'm thinking, oh God, what am I going to do? I started praying that the door would open. And you all, I prayed and I would not let go. I started declaring that that door would open, even though I could see my keys sitting on the seat of that car. But I would not relent. I would not relent. I kept saying this door is going to open. And in my mind's eye, I kept seeing the door opening and that door opened. I don't remember how long I stood there, maybe 20, 25 minutes, but I was determined. I am not going to give up. I'm desperate. I need this car door to open. And I believe that the most high can help me and I would not let up and the door opened you all that happened twice it happened to me twice but it's something that i can build on now it's it's a memorial for me it's something that i will never forget because i rehearse it in my mind so i know that the power of the kingdom is real i know that it's for us but we have to receive it by faith so again i only share my testimonies to help you to help others who may not have had those experiences or for those who have had experiences but you've forgotten you didn't write it down you didn't record it in your memory bank pull those memories back out write them down rehearse them this is what we were supposed to do. This is what Moses tried to tell our people. You need to remember these things so that when you experience these tests and these trials, you know that, okay, he did it for me then. He'll do it for me now. He brought us out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. Surely, surely he is able to deliver us now. But we have to receive it by faith. So as we close this out, remember to create memorials. Have things that you can point to when the enemy starts whispering in your ear saying, well, what if this doesn't work? You're going to look like a fool. You can look back at the things the Most High did before and then say, look how he came through for me in that situation. He rescued me when I needed help in the other situation. Those memories help you to respond in faith. This picture is one that we have in our home. My husband bought this years ago and I look at it often because it's a great example of what faith looks like. You almost have to behave like you have on blinders, but the blinders help you to stop focusing on the natural things going on around you that would cause you to fear.
Instead, see these things as opportunities that serve as tests for you to see what you've learned or haven't learned. Trust me, you all, I know that the walk of faith can seem like you're out on a ledge and the Most High says, now walk. <laughs> but do you see the hand in the middle of the picture? It's ready to hold them up. He won't let you fall. To walk by faith, we need a firm conviction of the character of the one who said it. So in preparation for our transition, let's grow from faith to faith. Here a little, there a little. Continue to grow in the knowledge of the word and remember those victories you've had in the past. Rehearse them. Meditate on those victories. And don't forget the victory of the the victories of our forefathers and our mothers. Those memories will help to increase our faith as well so that we can receive what belongs to us from the kingdom. I hope this message has been a blessing to you. Join me next time. Shalom, everyone.